Hey Data Junkies, welcome back. We are moving along on our module for Simple Linear Regression, and we've already covered a lot of ground so far on how to go ahead and think about these foundationally, looking at them in terms of their model performance, talking about how we can do them in R, and I gave you many different examples on how we can interpret and read these correlation, I'm sorry, regression outputs. So now we're going to tack a little bit in a slightly different direction, and we're going to continue working on the simple regression. But instead of having a continuous independent variable, we are looking at categorical independent variables, and how can we go ahead and use those? So with categorical variables, the big question is, can we use them? And I wouldn't be having this video chat with you if we couldn't. So yes, we can certainly use them. We can use all kinds of categorical variables here. The difference is, how are they coded? What are they measuring? And that's going to help us determine how we can use them in our regression model itself. Now, if these are Likert style or any sort of categorical variable that's lots of ranks, like we're looking at income data and it's got 20 something groups of income, then yeah, we can go ahead and use them sort of as is in our regression model. They could be either the dependent variable or the independent in this particular case. But keep in mind, it's going to change how we do these interpretations, just like how we use them in t-tests and novas uh, and anywhere else that we needed a numeric based variable, we can use that soft rule to kind of squeak through our large number of categories or no variables there, okay? Uh, but if they are either dichotomous variables, those are the ones that only have two different groups, or they, if they are nominal variables with many groups, or if they are ordinal groups with less than five, then we need to see how we can go ahead and use them. The dichotomous ones uh, or ordinals with just two groups, they're ready to go. The others, we're going to need some recoding work. So let's go ahead and see how does this change how we do our interpretations when we're dealing with high category ordinals, okay? Now, if you're doing with the high category ordinals, these are the ones that have five or more categories, it's, it's going to change how we do the, uh, the verbal interpretations here because we're talking about ranking groups. And on the slide screen here, I have for you uh, always a recommendation to check the variables level coding before you go ahead and put these in the model so you can understand the direction and the range of the level ranks uh, as they go in. You can use functions like str, class, levels, unclass, all those will help give you an approximation. Now, if your independent variable is numeric and your dependent variable is one of these high category ordinals, then the way we make this interpretation is that a one unit change in your x or your independent variable corresponds to an average coefficients rank change in y. Okay, so where we stick in the ordinal, we're now looking at not just a coefficients change, but a coefficients rank change. Let's compare that to if you have a high category IV and a numeric DV. So then what we're saying is a one rank change in the IV corresponds to an average coefficients unit change in your DV, right? So when ordinal is your IV, it's the rank change in the IV corresponds to the average coefficients unit change in the DV. If they're both high rank ordinals, then what we're looking at is a one rank change in your IV corresponds to an average coefficients rank change in your DV, right? So all you need to do to transition from the numeric variables to the categorical ones is understand that these are rank changes, group changes, and they have to be in a sort of an ordered format in order to work here. All right. So let's take an example out of this. Let's go ahead and look at the GSS General Social Survey 2016 data. And I've got two variables. One of them is called Pride Org and the other one's called Proud Work. Pride Org asks somebody, how much pride do you have in your organization? And the other one says, how much pride do you take in your work? Both of them are Likert style, going from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And on the far end of both of these, I have the levels, so we can see that strongly agree corresponds with level code 1, strongly disagree corresponds with level code 5. So as the ranks increase in size from 1 to 5, we are finding a more disagreeable opinion on both pride and organization and pride and work. So let's go ahead and we can take these two uh, five category ordinals, these Likert style ordinals, and I'm going to do a quick correlation test on them. Note I'm doing it as numeric. You could also do an as dot integer. Because these are still factors in the data set, I need to convert them to a number mode in order to access their, their level coded ranks. 
right? The regression and the correlation are not going to work if you leave them as just plain factors and it picks up the strongly agree as a text label. It's not going to know what to do with it. So we need to put it into a numeric mode. Once I've done that, we see that there is a very strong p-value, very small p-value between these values, and it has a positive uh, moderate to large correlation value, a positive 0.44. So that says as the rank values increase for pride and work, the rank values increase for pride in your organization. And when we said those ranks increase, we mean as you become more uh, disagreeing with pride and work, you're becoming more disagreeing with pride in your organization. When I put this into the regression test itself here, I am regressing pride in your organization on pride in your work. And so pride in the organization is our DV tilde, pride in my work is my IV. We have very strong statistically significant results here. Uh, and we have, it shows the as.numeric pride work in my independent variable there with a coefficient estimate of 0 0.45 rounded. So what that's saying is, uh, I'm going to round that just for purposes of discussion. It's a little easier to say, up to a 0.5. So for each additional rank change in pride in your work, that's going to correspond to an average rank, half a rank change in pride in your organization. Now, because these are ordinals, half ranks, it's really tough to think about being in between half a rank. So if you need it to get to a whole rank change to make more sense to you, and also to figure out if it's substantively significant or not, how meaningful these differences are, what we're saying then is a two rank change in pride in your work corresponds to an average one rank change in pride in your organization. So you can imagine if somebody goes from strongly agree to a neutral in pride in your work, that's going to make them go from, say, agree to neutral or strongly agree to neutral, a one rank change. Or if somebody was agree and you change them to disagree, that's going to take them from agree to neutral or neutral to disagree, that two rank change to an average one rank change in the DV. And if we were looking at the R squared here, we can round this to about a 0.20. So about 20% of the variation in pride in your organization can be explained by how much pride you take in your work. And that kind of sums up this particular example here. Oh, we could also note the intercept as well. The intercept value is rounded to 1, but that's when we have a 0 value for pride in your work. These were coded from 1 to 5, so we never truly get a 0 score for pride in your work. So that, that intercept value there is uh, not directly interpretable when x is 0. Our lowest value is x is 1, which at a half a rank would mean that our average actual rank found at the at strongly agree is 1.5. So those that strongly agree in pride in your work are halfway between agreeing and strongly agreeing and taking pride in your organization. If that helps you kind of fill out and flesh out the understanding there on how we could use this y-intercept to understand it better. Let's go ahead and do one more example from also using the GSS data. And I want to know does the number of years of education you have affect your preference to work if work isn't necessary? Think of work if not necessary. If you happen to be financially well off enough that you don't have to work, but you still enjoy having uh, the experience of work and the satisfaction it brings you of working. So, and this is paid work. So inside the GSS data set, we have a variable called work. It's, it kind of pronounces as work and joy, W-R-K-E-N-J-O-Y. And it is also a Likert going from strongly agree to strongly disagree, also following that 1 to 5 coding scale. So as we go from 1 to 5, we are becoming more towards strongly disagreeing that you would work if work wasn't necessary. And my other variable was called EDUC for education. Now EDUC you don't see on the slide here, but it was coded as a factor. And so those numbers were being stored as text. So what I have is a brief code in which I can translate back into a numerical measure here, and I'm calling it educ.fix. And when I run my educ.fix after I've corrected it, we have anywhere from no years of education up to 20 years of education, with the average being about 12 and 13 at the quartiles. So, so that's being right around 12 years would be high school. So you can imagine most people have a high school education or some education, maybe early college right afterwards. 
Let's go ahead and look at these in terms of a correlation here. And we have a p-value of 0 0.03, which is still, if we had a, a p-value of 0 0.05, is still statistically significant. The correlation value, though, is rather small and negative. Our correlation value is negative 0 0.05. So we're seeing that as education increases, there's a very small association towards uh, if you would work if you had to. Now, because it's negative, that means that as education goes up, we tend to have a greater preference to wanting to work if we didn't need to. But this correlation value is so small, it's almost no association at all, despite being statistically significant, just to confirm that there's very little association there. If we were to put this into a regression plot here, not regression plot, just a regression, uh, our output then says that, again, we have the same p-value we did from the correlation, both for the model and the uh, independent variable, which is expected. So we would be statistically significant at 0 0.05 alpha. And our value for b for the education is negative 0 0.12 rounded. This again is very small. So that's saying for every additional year of increase in your education, we have a negative 0.2 rank change in your opinion on working if work was necessary. Now that is such a small change, it's very meaningless uh, when we scale this. A rank change, you need to have at least a rank change of one to go from one categorical response option to another, to go from agree to neutral, or neutral to disagree, disagree to strongly disagree, and so on. So that's with a rank change of one. We would need, if, you're, if, our, if our coefficient here is negative 0.2 rounded, I would need a whole lot of those to multiply to get to one. I would need about 50 years of education to get one rank change in opinion of work as work was necessary. And so that's completely out of the bounds of reality to have 50 continuous years of education, or just 50 years of education in general. Some people might have it, but it's, we've truncated our, our count at 20 here. So that's generally where it's getting at. And then it also says that when we have no years of education, we have a 2.6 average for our y-intercept, meaning that when we have no years of education, which is a possible value in our results here, that we would have about a two and a half uh, placement on our Likert ranks of working if you have to. So they would be somewhere between neutral and disagreeing about working if they would have to. But then again, having no years of education is going to be highly unlikely for most of the results here. But it is uh, mathematically possible in this particular case here. Uh, and again, the adjusted R-squared is ridiculously small at 0 0.003, uh, which corresponds from that small correlation that we had before. So although we are statistically significant in these results here, we are not meaningfully significant in our results as well. And that's going to go ahead and wrap up this uh, introduction on how we're using categorical variables inside our simple linear regression. The next video series, we're going to be talking about binary uh, IVs and how they work in your regression as well. I'll see you then.